This is The Climate Question on the BBC World Service with Kate Lamble and Jordan Dunbar. Wherever you are, close your eyes for two seconds and try and picture a remote island with clear skies and sandy beaches. I'm stepping ashore on San Cristobal Island, part of the eastern chain of the Galapagos. The caramel sand beach is really warm underfoot and the ocean is a vibrant royal blue and I'm staring up at jumbled volcanic cliffs. And, well, just along the beach from me is a sea lion luxuriating in the surf and on the rocks I can see a uh, marine iguana, just one of those many special, unique, endemic creatures you can see in the Galapagos. Environmental writer Mark Stratton really got the good gig this week. Yeah, per Mark. (laughs) He's in the Galapagos, a string of islands in the Pacific Ocean, about a two-hour flight from Ecuador. They're famous because a huge variety of often unique animals live on and around them. So you'll be seeing some of the classic and iconic species like blue-footed boobies, perhaps the Galapagos penguin, marine iguanas, land iguanas. But the Galapagos are also famous for another reason. The very island Mark has arrived on is where the naturalist Charles Darwin landed in the 1800s. Darwin's ideas for the theory of evolution started right here. Today, the animals of the Galapagos are under the same pressures as those in many other parts of the world. Because of the changing climate, waters are getting warmer, extreme weather events more frequent. And it got us thinking, can animals evolve to deal with climate change? So the closest I've ever been to the Galapagos, Jordan, it was actually in Cambridge, England. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, I was visiting a museum there, a zoology museum, and we were behind the scenes. So that means we were surrounded by cupboards and cupboards of dead things. Horrible. That's creepy. (laughs) I know. We just passed this dodo skeleton and the skin of a Tasmanian tiger. As you do. As you do. When the curator said, close your eyes and hold out your hands. No. So I did. No, terrible idea. (laughs) I bet you were wondering what was going to be put in them. Yeah, and when I opened my eyes, what I was holding was this tiny bird, kind of brown, nothing much to look at. But what it was, was one of the finches that Charles Darwin himself collected and brought back from the Galapagos Islands. So that's 150 years old. And finches, they were the bird that Charles Darwin used to explain the theory of evolution. Yeah, and to help us understand what evolution is in this programme, I thought it might be helpful to understand the story of Darwin's finches because the two are really interconnected. So when Mark was in the Galapagos for us, he met Kyoko Gatanda. She's an assistant professor from Brock University in Canada who studies these same birds. When Darwin got to the Galapagos Islands, he actually wasn't that interested in the finches. They were kind of a drab colour and they didn't have a very interesting song. He sampled, though, the finches from different islands. And so when he got back to England and he was looking at all the variation in beak shape and size and body size and shape, and he was recalling how certain finches were found on certain islands but not on other islands. Darwin came to the conclusion that certain beak shapes helped the birds access the food which was available on their island. Those that needed to crush seeds had thick, strong beaks. The ones which needed to reach into trees and grab insects had thin, pointy ones. What happened was those born with a beak that could help them get more food were more likely to survive and have more babies than those that hadn't. Over time, as the successful birds passed down their genes, it looked like the birds had changed to fit into their environment It's what we know as evolution. More than 150 years later, Darwin's finches are still evolving. Kyoko has been studying this. What's driving the changes this time, she says, is the main difference to the Galapagos since Darwin visited. People have arrived in their thousands. Yeah, so some colleagues of mine earlier had found that the medium ground finch here on Santa Cruz at our remote site, they have actually two different morphs. So there's sort of two beak sizes within one species. That used to be the case near town too, but recently they discovered those differences in beak size had disappeared in birds near human settlements. And so it got us thinking about, well, okay, what's the difference between the remote site and the site right by town? And the important thing was humans 
And the thing with human foods is it doesn't matter what size or shape beak you have to be able to consume human foods. So that sort of selection that was maintaining what we think were these large morph and small morph of the medium ground finch is now disappeared with the presence of humans and human foods. Previously, we thought evolutionary changes could only be seen after hundreds, maybe even thousands of years. But the finch's Kyoko studies, the changes she talks about, happened in about 40 years. Evolution can happen fast. The question is, if animals are already evolving in front of our very eyes as a result of human activities, can they also evolve as a result of the impact we're having on the climate? I was always the kid who had the tadpoles in a jar and was out catching the snakes and so on. Tor Hansen is a conservation biologist in the western United States. He's written a book about climate change and evolution, looking at some of the species on the front line of global warming. So I think we're all familiar with that sort of iconic climate change image of the polar bear on the shrinking iceberg up there in the Arctic. But if you could look beyond the bear and peer over the edge of the ice, you might catch a glimpse of the little auk. So it's a dear little creature, a very beautiful little bird, and one that scientists have always considered to be at high risk from climate change because it is dependent historically upon plankton that gather at the edges of those ice flows. And the ice, as we all know, is shrinking as the planet warms. Worried that as the ice melted, the birds would have to fly further and further to reach their food, scientists trekked all the way to Franz Josef Land in the Arctic Circle, where the little auk live. They strapped tiny trackers to them to see how far the birds had to travel. And they predicted that the birds would be in the air for at least an hour to reach that ice. And so when they got the first data back in from these little monitors, they were astounded because the birds had been in the air for less than four minutes. So they're thinking that these birds are flying marathons every day to the edge of the ice, but actually they're just nipping to the shop around the corner. That's exactly right. And they discovered something remarkable. And that is the same warming that was causing the ice to recede was also melting the glaciers on the island. And as that glacial water ran down in these growing rivers out into the fjords, it would slam into the cold, dark currents of the Arctic Ocean. And at that interface was just like, for a plankton at least, swimming into a a brick wall. And they were stunned, in some cases killed, creating this curtain of plankton right in front of the nesting colony of the little ox. With an all-you-can-eat buffet installed right by their front door, scientists found that, for now, far from being under threat, the colony was thriving. Little orcs aren't the only ones making a switch. Those sea lions lounging about on the beaches of the Galapagos? Some naturalists report seeing them diving deeper than ever before as their prey has moved to cooler waters. To be clear, this isn't evolution. By definition, evolution requires genetic changes in an animal. Discovering a new restaurant isn't that. But adapting your behaviour as the environment changes around you can make a big difference to survival. Yeah, and not every species is as lucky. We find particular worry in species that are highly specialised. So if you have bees that are focused upon particular species of flowers, um, those are specialised relationships that are very vulnerable to rapid change, as opposed to creatures that are very general in their habits. The generalists have a lot more flexibility built in to their makeup and are in a better position now to cope with climate change. That means something like a raccoon is going to be very happy all the way around the world as things change because it's very happy to eat garbage. Ah, uh-huh. so if you're picky, it's, it's much worse. Picky eaters have a really rough time, evolutionary speaking. Learning how to adapt to your food source slowly moving is one thing, but surviving an extreme weather event is something else entirely. We know that things like floods and hurricanes are likely to become more frequent as the climate warms. Back in the Galapagos, they have their own phenomenon, El Niño. 
During an El Nino event, winds that normally blow warm water away from the Galapagos stop. So the surrounding ocean heats up and it starts interfering with the sea currents, which lowers the nutrients in the waters around the island chain. Romero Tamala was born in the Galapagos. He still works as a naturalist and expedition leader, and he's seen the impacts of an El Nino event. So for most of the people, it basically means very strong rains. The kids love it because we have waterfalls forming off of cliffs and people can shower in the streets and everything. But for the wildlife, it has a different impact. The, the waters around Galapagos get really warm and the food becomes scarce for marine species. Mark Stratton. This is a naturally occurring event, but anecdotal evidence and scientific evidence that I heard out there in the Galapagos suggests that El Nino is an occurring event which is intensifying both in its strength and also its frequency. I think one of the interviews I recorded, Romero, said... Lately, it's been occurring a lot more often than it should. Right now, we have an El Nino event, a strong El Nino event every eight years, before it used to be every 12 years, before that it was every 15 years. One animal that has to cope with the consequences is the marine iguana. Now, marine iguanas aren't exactly pretty. Charles Darwin called them hideous looking. <laughs> oh, but they are amazing. They're the only ocean-going lizards. They forage in the sea for algae and they have these special glands that filter salt out of their blood. El Nino events can be fatal for marine iguana populations because their food can disappear. So during one of the strong El Ninos in the 1980s, we realized that they were losing a lot of fat and they were so skinny. You could see the bones because there wasn't enough food. And we actually weighed them to see how much weight they had lost. But we realized when we weighed them that they had lost all the percentage of fat plus some more. And we, we said, well, how can they lose some more? They have no fat. What else could they lose? So we did another more in-depth study and we actually realized that the bodies of the iguanas were changing. The bone structure was reducing itself. So the iguanas themselves were becoming smaller to be able to survive on less food. This is amazing, right? Animals changing the size of their bones in response to environmental factors. Kate, <laughs> this sounds like evolution. Actually, again, it's not. Come on. You see, in evolution, we'd expect larger marine iguanas to die off and the smaller ones to pass their genes on. But here is something else, something weirder. Go on. What's happening here is that the genetic possibility for the iguana to be smaller was always built into its DNA. An El Nino event just triggered those genes to be expressed in a different way. And actually, marine iguanas aren't even the only animals to be able to do this. Back in 2012, there was a series of ocean warming events in the Gulf of California near Mexico, and local fishermen could no longer catch Humboldt squid. They thought the massive population had disappeared. But when scientists investigated, they found the squid had just got smaller. Turns out they've got this same genetic ability. Tor Hansen. You can imagine then if you had a large tank full of water and Humboldt squid over generations, you could essentially control the size of the squid by adjusting the temperature of the water. When the water is hot and conditions are stressful, it triggers the small sized body. And when the waters are cool and conditions are plentiful, the bodies are large. So the Humboldt squid, they can get smaller and adapt. But if things changed again, they could get bigger. That is correct. Yes. Both those lifestyle opportunities, if you will, <laughs> are inherent in their, in their genomes. Kate, we've heard about lots of ways that animals are adapting to rising temperatures, but we have yet to find a single example of evolution as a result of climate change. There might be a reason for that. Anne Charmantier is an evolutionary ecologist at a huge research centre, the CEFE in Montpellier, southern France. She says proving evolution has taken place is incredibly hard. Very often we don't see any visual evidence of evolution, so we have to go behind the scenes. She looks after a data set started in the 1970s. 
Santa started noting it down before Anne was even born. And like a family business, she'll have to pass it on to someone else when she retires. A lifelong commitment. What Anne watches are nest boxes used by two types of garden bird common in Europe. Blue tits and great tits. They're far from immune to the threats of the changing climate. In 2019, for example, there was a heat wave. Temperatures here in Montpellier, for example, were six degrees higher than any temperature ever recorded in the area. And I think it was 43.5 degrees. Wow. I have a very vivid memory of that day, actually, because it started off really as a sense of weirdness. The day was very silent and no one was in the streets. That day I decided to go and check all the nest boxes and uh, I was expecting to see many nestlings and that's not what I saw. The entire nest of chicks was dead, killed by the heat. And there's more these birds need to cope with than occasional extreme weather. The very seasons they arrange their lives around are changing. Spring is arriving earlier by the decade. So we know that uh, trees are blooming earlier in spring, almost everywhere in the planet. And that means that the environment in which the birds are living, in which they are breeding, uh, has shifted. So the calendar events are happening earlier in spring. And that's a big change for the birds. Scheduling is important. Birds need caterpillars to feed their chicks. So they need to time their egg laying along with the trees whose new leaves feed the caterpillars. To keep up with the changing arrival of spring, Anne says garden birds have, on average, moved their breeding earlier by two weeks over the last half century. And that's astonishing, because it means many people will have seen this happening from their kitchen windows within their lifetime. Absolutely. For some species, this change is a result of behaviour. For others, Anne says, this is proof of their genetics changing, meaning evolution. We do have quite a few evidence where we are quite certain (laughs) that climate change has induced evolution for organisms advancing their reproduction. I talked about birds, but it's true also for mammals. There's a very good demonstration in red deer on the Isle of Rum in Scotland. Migration is also advancing over time. Studies on everything from snow voles in Switzerland to birds in the Brazilian Amazon have also shown warmer temperatures have caused animals to evolve smaller bodies. It's easier to keep cool. Paul Hansen has a good example of evolution driven by the climate. So if you can imagine a small lizard, roughly iguana-shaped, you can picture an anole. Anole lizards live on the Turks and Caicos Islands just north of the Caribbean. In 2017, a team of researchers, led by a man called Colin Donoghue, had been out studying these scaly fellas. They completed their measurements and went home happy, pockets full of lizard data. Then... We're getting our first look at Hurricane Irma, hitting the Caribbean islands right now, one of the most powerful storms ever. Hurricane Maria has joined the growing list of major hurricanes to impact the Caribbean and the US in recent weeks. Hurricanes. Our researcher wondered, what impact would that have on the lizards? So he went down there again with his team and they found themselves in a sort of a case of scientific deja vu. They were repeating the precise same study they had just completed six weeks earlier. So they're there pulling every lizard off a tree, holding it up against the ruler, seeing how long it is. Taking all of these measurements, you know, and they immediately saw this pattern in the data. They saw that ones that had survived were the lizards with the largest pads on their toes and the ones with long, strong looking uh, front legs. But these lizards' back legs were measurably shorter. Could these features have helped them survive the hurricanes? An investigation was necessary. Luckily, they had planned ahead and brought with them to the Caribbean a leaf blower. (laughs) (laughs) Hang on, what makes you pack a leaf blower on a holiday to the Caribbean? He did have a reason, and the reason was this, that you knew that to really understand this situation, they were going to need to be able to observe lizard behavior in high winds And since you can't really stand there safely in a hurricane taking notes on lizards, they decided to make their own hurricane by using the leaf blower. Imagine the scene, a small lizard perched on a stick. On comes the leaf blower and they hold on for dear life. 
be clear, no lizards were harmed in the making of this experiment. They were caught in a soft net and released. But what you can see is that large toe pads and strong front legs give some lizards a tighter grip. When they do start to let go and their body starts flapping in the air like a flag, smaller back legs reduce the drag and allow them to cling on and survive the hurricane. So the survivors were those lizards with those characteristics and they passed those traits along to their offspring. They checked other areas across the Caribbean and found wherever hurricanes were frequent, these same characteristics were common. Proof of evolution in action. Evolution then does take place, but it doesn't mean species are out of the woods. Evolution requires an animal to pass successful genes onto their children. That's much easier for an aphid type of insect. It can produce a new generation every five days. Galapagos giant tortoises, on the other hand, need something like 25 years. Evolutionary ecologist Anne Charmantier. So the fact that different species, particularly because of their uh, lifespan, are evolving at different rates, it can create uh, mismatches across the food chain. Relationships which have remained steady for hundreds of thousands of years can get out of sync. And there's another problem. Anne thinks that in the long run, even species which are so far coping quite well will have a hard time keeping up with just how fast the climate is changing. We have mathematical models that allow us to predict how fast evolution can happen. Even if the selection is strong and even if the trait is very heritable, evolution takes time and it takes at least a few generations before we can see some adaptation via evolution. And when we build these predictive models, what we see is that the speed at which the climate is warming is much faster than any evolutionary response that the large majority of wildlife can attain. We have concluded that in most cases, even if evolution does happen, it's not happening fast enough compared to the warming. We've heard the threat of climate change being described in the past as a code red for humanity. This shows it's a code red for the animal kingdom too. If there is some hope, it's that all the research we've done so far can help us worry smarter. Tor Hansen. One of the real purposes of all this climate change biology research is to help identify those species that have some resilience and help us to then allocate our resources in terms of research, conservation and policy to the species and the systems that really need our help the most. The picky eaters. Exactly. Save the picky eaters. (laughs) My mother always told me not to eat garbage. But in this instance, she's absolutely wrong. Because if you're willing to eat garbage like a raccoon or fox, you're more likely to survive. Yeah, I think what I'm taking away actually is I think in my head, evolution was still something that takes thousands of years. It's kind of incredible that we're seeing it happen now within many people's lifetimes. Absolutely. And though it is a sad situation, there is a positive The evolution and a few other adaptations are helping some animals handle the changing climate. Yeah, the future is clearly concerning, but I really love this idea of worrying smarter. Targeting our conservation work and where we spend our money is likely to make a big difference to the variety of life we'll find in the Galapagos and elsewhere in the future. Big thanks to our ever-evolving team, producer Dervil Starr, series producer Alex Lewis, editor Nicola Adiman, and the man who makes the mix, Tom Bricknell. 